In this chapter, we will learn about current and resistance. We will learn about the current in any circuit, which is simply charges in motions. We will learn about the factors that govern the current in any circuit. We will learn about Ohm's law, about electric power, and about superconductivity. In this image, we see a magnet, permanent magnet that floats freely above nitrogen cooled ceramic superconductor. This is called the Meissner effect, which results in magnetic lobulation of permanent magnets. And it has many important applications. As we see in this illustration, wherever there are charges in motion, there will be an electric current. Here we see positive charges crossing this area, moving to the right. As a result, they create an electric current. By convention, the direction of the electric current is taken as the direction of motion of positive charges. Now, the quantity of charges crossing this area per unit time is taken as a measure of the electric current. So by definition, we define the electric current as the change in charge per unit time, delta Q by delta T. Here, we are assuming that delta T is long enough so we are dealing with average quantity. You take the initial time, the final time, the difference is delta T, and you check on the amount of charge across this area during that time. The ratio delta Q by delta T is equal to the average current. From this definition, the unit of current is equal to one coulomb per one second. One coulomb per second. This is the SI unit of the electric current. This unit is called Ampere, Ampere, honoring the French physicist André Ampere for his contribution to the field. So one Ampere is equal to one Coulomb per second. That's to say the current will be one Ampere when a charge of one Coulomb crossed the conductor in a period of time equal to one second. If you consider the situation when the time is very small, delta t goes to zero, then the average current now will yield the instantaneous current. So the instantaneous current is equal to the limit when delta t goes to zero of delta q divided by delta t. It is possible to have both positive charges and negative charges in the conductor moving, and the net current will be the addition of both currents. You add the current due to the positive charges to the current due to the negative charges in order to get the total current. By convention, the direction of the positive charges is given to the conventional current. Therefore, the direction of motion for negative charges will be opposite to the conventional current. Electrons are negatively charged. So in conductors like copper, electrons will be moving opposite to the conventional current. Conventional current is assigned to the direction of motion for positive charges. Therefore, electrons will be opposite to the conventional current. 
as charges move in equidector from higher potential to lower potential, there is a drop in the potential energy that can be calculated from this formula, which we learn in chapter 16, Q delta V. You need the change in voltage between the initial and final voltage levels. Once you have delta V multiplied by Q, you get the change in the potential energy. Inside wires, charges usually are negative electrons. So delta U will be a drop in the potential energy and can be calculated from this same formula. Now, if you consider the motion of electrons inside a conductor like a copper wire, having a cross-sectional area A, then the drift motion of the electrons as a result of the applied voltage will create the current. How to calculate the current from the drift velocity? To do that, consider a volume of the conductor like this volume. We can calculate the volume cross-sectional area A multiplied by the height, delta X, and delta X is equal to the drift velocity multiplied by the time, so it's VD delta T. If the density of charges in the conductor is N, the number of charges per unit volume, then we can calculate the change in charge delta Q from the number of charges multiplied by the charge carried by a single electron. So the volume is A delta X multiplied by the density of charges N multiplied by Q, the charge carried by a single electron. This will give us delta Q. For good conductors like copper, N is too big. It is of the order of 10 to the power 28 electrons per cubic meter. We substitute for delta X, it is V delta T. So now delta Q is equal to Na VD delta T Q. We have calculated delta Q now in order to calculate the current, we need to divide delta Q by delta T, delta Q by delta T. So delta T cancels out, and the current is equal to NQVDA. That's how we calculate the current from the microscopic properties of the conductor. We see that the current depends on the drift velocity. It is directly proportional with the drift velocity. N, Q, and A are constants in the density of free charge in the conductor. This is constant, as I said, 10 to the power 28 electrons per cubic meter for copper. Q, the charge of a single electron, 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So we have these two factors, the drift velocity and the cross-sectional area that will govern the current inside the conductor. In this graph, we have an idea about the behavior of electrons inside a conductor. If you try to track one electron as it moves, it has this collision, which will change the direction Another collision will change the direction. A third collision will change the direction this way. Very much similar to billiard balls because electrons are identical. They have the same mass, just like billiard balls. When they collide, they change direction. So you have this random motion, random behavior for electrons. But once you apply the electric field, so now there will be an electric force opposite to the electric field that will act on the electrons. And as a result, in addition to their random motion, they will be drifting 
there will be drifting along the direction of the electric force. This is the reason we have this drift velocity. It is a direct result of applying the electric field. The electric field results from the potential difference between the two ends of the conductor. If you turn E to zero, if you turn the battery off, no voltage difference, so no electric field, then the drift velocity goes to zero and only the random motion continues. But once you turn the battery on, you have the applied voltage on, the electric field on, so now you have the drift velocity and a result, as a result, you will have the electric current. Suppose a current carrying wire has a cross-sectional area that gradually becomes smaller along the wire so that the wire has the shape of a very long truncated cone. How does the drift speed vary along the wire? To answer this question, we know that the current, which is the amount of charges per second, is a constant quantity. So here, the relationship between the drift velocity and the cross-sectional area, they are equal to constant current because the total charge per unit time is constant. So if A gets less, then V should get more, bigger smaller a corresponds to higher values of the drift velocities and bigger values of a corresponds to smaller values of drift velocity okay so it speeds up as the cross section becomes smaller 